evening and welcome to tonight's regular scheduled uh, meeting of the Board of Education. Um, just as a point of good order, and I'll do it myself, if everybody could turn off their cell phones, even uh, if they're on vibrate because they go to the RF feeds and goof up the microphones for the public broadcast, so appreciate that. I know many of our young people will go into withdrawal for a half hour, but... <laughs> half hour? Is that your <laughs> Okay, that said, uh, we'll move on to calling of the roll. Madam Secretary. All right. President Malt is not with us tonight. Vice President Wasserman. Here. And I'm here. Treasurer Ole. Here. Member Brandstad. Here. Member Gordon. Here. And Member Kaminsky. Here. We have a quorum. Um, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, I'll just roughly go through each item that's on the consent agenda, and then uh, board's pleasure to comment or remove or add to that. Uh, in it are the approval of the regular meeting minutes from our last meeting, uh, several staff member resignations, um, and I'll speak to this one a little more, uh, insurance for our property um, going forward into the future, including our uh, vacant, currently vacant buildings. Um, approval of, and that's for $244,097 for next year's insurance on property. Approval of the payment of the system's bills for the month of October 2012 of $7.7 7 million, $7 million. And there's also a list of purchase card transactions with our purchase card transaction process. I move approval of consent items 2.1 through 2.4. Support. We have movement by Mr. Oley and support by Dr. Kaminsky. Any comment or questions on any of the items? See none, I'll take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Consent uh, agenda approved. At this moment, we move into request to address the board. Uh, anybody in the audience who would like to address the board, feel free to come to the podium. And if you do so, please state your name and school area you're within. Mike? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to Board of Education matters, and uh, we'll begin with uh, why this large August group is here. And uh, this is a resolution to recognize the Dow High State tennis champs again, which is always fun to do. And I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Baker to read the resolution. It would be my pleasure. Whereas the Charger 2012 Varsity Boys Tennis Team successfully achieved its fourth straight Division II state championship, whereas the Charger 2012 Varsity Boys Tennis Team captured championships at five flights at the Division II state championship, whereas the Charger 2012 Varsity Boys Tennis Team was the top-ranked Division II team in the state of Michigan, Whereas the Charger 2012 Varsity Boys Tennis Team won their seventh consecutive title at the Saginaw Valley League Tournament. Whereas the Charger 2012 Varsity Boys Tennis Team was victorious at every flight of the Saginaw Valley League Tournament. Whereas the Charger 2012 Varsity Boys Tennis Team represented themselves, their team H.H. Dow High Midland Public Schools and the City of Midland very proudly and with great respect for their opponents, officials, equipment, and venues. Whereas Terry Schwartzkopf, coach of the Charger 2012 Varsity Boys Tennis Team, led this exceptional team courageously and effectively displaying sportsmanship and pride throughout this extremely competitive season. Therefore, be it resolved, the Midland Public Schools Board of Education formally recognizes and congratulates the Charger 2012 Varsity Boys Tennis Team for their seventh consecutive Saginaw Valley League title and fourth straight Division II team state title. We wish this team and coach <coughs> continued success in all of their future sports and academic endeavors, dated this 26th day of November 2012. Take a motion to support the resolution. So move. Support. Moved by Mr. Oley and supported by Dr. Kaminsky. Comments and pleasure of the board. I guess this comment, it seems like we've been here before and having this discussion. And, um, you know, I don't want to necessarily use the words domination and dynasty, although they'd probably be uh, appropriate for that. I think what is um, extra special, it's not just the fact that you have won in such a dominating fashion for so long including this year, obviously, it's how you want it. And I think that's, those are lifelong lessons there. And you want it with character, you want it with pride, you want it with humility, 
Um, and you want it with respect for the game and your competitors and your colleagues and your teammates and your parents and your families in the community. And I think that's what sets you apart above and beyond anybody else who wins competition like that. It's, it's how you want it. So I just wanted to say thank you for representing our community and yourselves and your families so well in your school. Um, and just congratulate you and wish you good luck in the future. And, and also yeah. just uh, congratulations and thank you. I'm just curious, are all the teammates, are they all seniors? Is there any teammates that have had more than one chance? I mean, you know, in the experience and, in, well, yeah, as a team. So there's been, there's been, the kids have been on the team for uh, two years in a row and they've had last year championship. You've had some four years, don't you? Yeah, some yeah. four years. Okay. Yeah. yeah, just, I'm just thinking about the, the, the these uh, teammates that have been together, I guess what I'm getting to is they've had, I mean, a, a high school experience that's just amazing that we would dream about as a, uh, as playing any sport in high school, that's just great. I'm, I'm just happy for the uh, for the students and the, the teammates. Any others? Listen, congratulations! I know how hard you all worked year around to do what you did. So congratulations to all of you. With that, Terry, would you, uh, or Mr. Schwartzkopf, more appropriately, would you come forward? I'll bring at the podium there because I'll ask you to speak. On behalf of not only Midland Public Schools, but the community of Midland at large and the larger tennis community in Midland, we like to call ourselves uh, Tennis Town USA. You guys are a big, big, big part of that, a big part of that. Congratulations, Thank and you. thanks for everything you do. Scared to give me the mic. Um, you, you know, the... Uh, the success of this program has uh, mostly to do with the, the hard work, character, the the effort that these kids have put in since you know they were very very young. Um, we've got incredible stories of growth. Um, you know Andrew Camp. Um, I want to single him out. Uh, freshman year, just decided to start playing tennis. He started at like eighth eighth doubles on the JV. <laughs> eighth doubles on the JV, and within four years is. Um, you know, playing at a varsity level, was the number one seed in the state, and um, set a few records in the, in the state record book in his one season um, uh, on the varsity. That's an incredible amount of growth. We got we got kids like um, uh, Austin Woody and, and, and Templeman and Reed who were, were with us all four years, you know. And I think what some people tend to forget is when we won our first championship, we graduated eight out of the 12 players. And so we had a ton of new people. And these guys, uh, the few of them that returned, really led the way. And they have just, they've led through the years. And um, the character that they leave behind is, in my opinion, even more important than the records that they've left behind in the record book. And the praise, you know, goes to the parents who are willing to foot the bill year round, uh, willing to foot the bill for travel. They, they go everywhere with us. Um, for Mike Woody and the relationship that we have with the Tennis Center. I think that's really been uh, solidified probably in the last six years. And uh, we spent a lot of time off season uh, talking and uh, deciding how we can make things better. And, um, you know, his, his enthusiasm and passion for the game does uh, nothing but buoy our kids. And they're excited when he, when he shows up for the, you know, the occasional practice and he's, when he's with us at the tournaments, he just brings a, a, a fire and an intensity that is refreshing in the middle of season when things start to not get old, but you get really tired. <laughs> you know, there's a lot. It, these guys don't get much time off. We have a full schedule. They play over 40 matches in a season, and um, it's just nonstop. So it's good to get that, that energy. And, um, you know, we've, we've celebrated together. And we've shed some tears. Well, I've shed some tears, you know. And these guys know how I feel, so I don't need to tell them. But I just want the community to know that these guys are, these, they really are the cream of the crop in Thank all you. aspects. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Always nice to start a board meeting with a topic like this. So thank you, guys. You buoy our spirits also. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. And feel free to, to leave if you if you feel you need to. I know you got homework and stuff tonight. You better have homework and stuff tonight. <laughs> Except my favorite so. will meeting. So. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for coming.
at this point, uh, unless you want to learn how millages work. <laughs> if you want to learn how tax millages work, feel free to stay, because Linda Klein is next on the agenda to walk us through our millage history and uh, educate all of us, including our public, a little bit on what our various millages are around education in Minimum Public Schools. All right, thank you. Uh, in front of you, you have a fairly large piece of paper, and this is not anything that was going to display particularly well on TV, so I thought it was probably better if you had it in your hands. Uh, but for the sake of the audience here, I did make a few extra copies, and they're sitting up here behind the podium if someone would, would like that just to refer to. Uh, we're going to call this Millage 101. We, have as you know, have just finished the Cobalt survey where we had some questions about sinking fund and technology bond, and that raised some other questions about what millages do we have. So this was a good time to revisit what we have and do a little bit of general education on the topic. We have to go all the way back to 1994. Passage of Proposal A established two classes of properties. They were homestead, and that was exempt from the 18 mil operating levy that was to be levied on other properties at that time. And homestead was really defined as a principal residence of the property owner. It wasn't just a place where someone lived, but it had to be the principal residence of the property owner. So rental property was not considered homestead. Uh, there were also some agricultural properties that are classified that way as well. And those properties in general statewide were exempt for, from the 18 mills, except in cases like Midlands where our original foundation allowance was slightly higher than the state maximum. So those, our homestead properties were not exempt from the full 18 mills, but from an amount that would take them down to just raising whatever that amount over the basic foundation had been. And for us, that was established as 5.6523 mills. That's our actual voted millage although we're not permitted to levy that. You know through the various tax resolutions we go to, you often hear me say the millage has to be set at a level to raise $415.31 per pupil. This is the millage that we're talking about. Second class of properties were the non-homestead properties. That was pretty much everything else. And they paid the full 18 mills. The hold harmless was considered part of that 18 mills, so they didn't pay 18 plus. They pay 18 inclusive of the hold harmless. That whole system was modified in 2008, which is why this paper looks so complicated. Prior to that time, you would have seen just two categories listed, the homestead properties and what was called the non-homestead. But in 2008, there were some changes in state tax law, and we stopped calling homestead homestead, although we typically still refer to it as that. It's now known as the PRE. It's the principal residence exemption, and those are the old homestead properties. Owner-occupied, and they are continue to be exempt from all except our hold harmless millage. At that time, all of the non-PREs were separated out, and industrial personal became exempt from all of the operating except the hold harmless. In addition, commercial personal was exempted from all but six mills of the operating, plus they have to pay the hold harmless. And then the remaining properties are the non-PREs, and those are the properties that pay the full 18 mills. That's all for operations. That's the money that comes in and supports our budget. Whatever those dollars uh, are, don't make up come through the state side for our foundation allowance. Uh, in addition, we have levied over the years the sinking fund. That has been our own millage, and you can see that began in 2002. And the last levy on that was with the 11-12 school year. And that was approved by the voters at 11-12, and all properties paid that. In 2009, uh, through your action, that was reduced to a levy of half a mil although the approved amount was still two, and that was because the ISD or the ESA passed the enhancement millage. And at that point, all of the voters across the ISD paid a full one and a half mills. So to hold our voters, I hate to use the word hold harmless because we use that to refer to a millage, uh, but to keep them even, you reduced our sinking fund and made it up through the enhancement, which could be used for operations. <coughs> 
that's not technically our millage. That's a millage that is levied by the intermediate school district under a very specific section of state law that specifies how the monies are distributed across all of the districts within the ESA. So that's not a Midland public millage. When I report to the city and to the county and the townships what millage is to levy on our behalf, it's just the operating on the commercial personal and the non-PRE, it's the supplemental or the hold harmless, and until this year it was the sinking fund. However, local voters do pay more if you want to consider them all school millages because the ESA, in addition to the enhancement millage, has their own operating millage and they have a special ed millage. So for your information, I included those numbers here. Uh, the ESA operating millage is two-tenths of a mil. That's 0 0.2 of a mil. Uh, and then the special ed millage, which we often internally refer to as Act 18 because that was the public act that authorized that. Uh, our ESA special ed millage is 0 0.9797, or not quite one full mil. So the ESA in total levies the one and a half enhancement, two tenths for their general operations, and then 0 0.9797 for special ed. And again, we have a countywide plan that specifies how that millage gets distributed. Uh, a certain amount is used to fund the cost of special education at the ESA, but then some of it comes back to the local districts as well. It's fairly complicated and probably a topic be best left for another day. The other millage that is paid by all of our taxpayers, regardless of the property tax classification, is the state education tax. That is not an MPS millage either. That is the state's own education tax levied on all properties. It is not voted, whereas our millages all have to be renewed on a regular basis. The state education tax is not a voted millage. And it is not levied by MPS. It is not levied by the ESA. It is the state's tax. It's levied by the county on behalf of the state. And that money goes directly to Lansing to support school operations. It gets redistributed back across the districts all over the state. But that is not an MPS millage. Uh, I checked with the city. If you look at your tax bill, it does say MPS in front of it because they've tried to break it out. Uh, the district uh, where the taxpayer is, but it's not our millage. And they're, they're going to correct that going forward uh, to better reflect the fact that it is not an MPS millage. The only MPS millages are, are operating and are supplemental. Now, a homeowner would not see the operating millage. All a homeowner would see today is the hold harmless millage. And you'll notice that over time, that amount that we levy be gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and that's because we're only permitted to levy the amount that's necessary to raise that 415.31. So as property values in the community increase, the amount of the millage levy gradually declines. And you can see uh, from the original 5.6523, in this current year, we're down to levying less than two mills. So in a nutshell, that's our, our tax history, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about it, or if you want to ask for something to come back, I'm happy to go look it up for you. Just thought as a point of reference, you may want to know that the last year before Proposal A, all of our taxpayers, there was no distinction between PRE, non-PRE, et cetera, uh, we had a voted operating millage of 29.6 mills, 26.45 of that was levied in the last year. And in addition, we had the plant repair, maintenance, and equipment millage, PRME. That was voted at 0.63 mills, levied at 0.43. It, so in the last year before Proposal A, our local taxpayers all paid 26.88 mills to support Midland public alone. And that was all money that came here.
Can you just quickly go through like the enhancement millage? How many years was that for? Like when will that be? The enhancement. You know, some of these like when when yes. do they end? The enhancement millage is a five year millage. And so you see the chart that I took out through this current year shows four years of collection. There will be one more year of collection. Uh, we need to renew our hold harmless and our operating millages. Uh, they expire. They were last voted in 2005 for a 10-year period. So we will need to hold an election before 2015. And those are millages where if uh, they're turned down, the state does not make up the balance. The state assumes that we're levying the full amount in order to collect the full foundation. So you may look at the State School Aid Act or our status report and it shows that our foundation is $8,141 per pupil. If for whatever reason we didn't levy either our hold harmless or a portion of our operating millage, our actual foundation would be something lower than the stated amount because the state's not interested in stepping up for <coughs> taxpayers who won't support their own schools. Angela, we've taken a look at the uh, in the FFO study committee of the board, <coughs> and we've shared with them a timeline when all those millages are coming up. And actually, we can bring that to the full board in December if you would like to see that. Because if we're going to get serious about a potential May election, and I'm going to share some preliminary results of a conference call we had this morning with the uh, Cobalt Communications Company that did our most recent survey. Mm -hmm. That would be good information to have, I think, for the whole public so mm -hmm. they can see. We've got quite a series of uh, elections that we're facing in the next three to four years. All right, sounds good. Anyone else? No, it's a good review. I appreciate you going back to the 90s, Sam, and it's a reflective yeah. period of time, so I can remember back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> and Linda, just to uh, just looking at these numbers a little bit, making a few comments, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on my comments. Every classification from homestead, industrial personal, commercial personal, or non-PRE have seen a millage reduction since 2004. Mm -hmm. They're paying less mills today in total taxes concerning schools than they were in, in 2002. I'm sorry. Then in 2002, yes. Yes. So everybody's yeah. down. Uh, personal uh, homestead, homestead, if you want to call it that, is down two and change. Mm -hmm. Uh, industrial personnel is down 16 and change. And so I'd like the voters to know that over time, the millages have actually decreased. I'm not saying that's less taxes as property values went up, but the millages have actually decreased for education funding for middle and public schools over the last, over the last decade. And then you, you said it, and I'd like to highlight it again, uh, the past board, four years ago board, when we went to the public about the voting for the enhancement millage, we promised MPS citizens that we would make an equal and opposite offset on their uh, on our sinking fund. And you highlighted it. And in fact, we did and kept uh, you know, call it whole or neutral the taxpayers at MPS for the enhancement millage as we went forward. For three years. For three years. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, or for the duration actually of the of the sinking fund because it dropped off. So um, I just wanted to point that out to everybody also as we move forward. Okay. We'll move on to the next agenda item, uh, Michigan Public Education Finance Project and uh, Oxford Foundation. It'll turn it over to Linda again. Yes, and don't be frightened by the big stack you see in front of me. <laughs> We're not going through this page by page tonight. Um, uh, Mr. Ellinger, did you want to make Just to make these comments, um, I've sent the board some information about a Senate bill and a House bill that's making its way through. It's getting a lot of airplay, the free press, and the news referred to it in the Sunday edition. Uh, the Oxford Foundation has sent out uh, at least three or four quick emails today on what this means, making a case that um, it's a good, serious reconsideration of how public schools are being financed. But independent of this report, although this report does refer to um, this Senate and this House bill that I'm going to speak to you about, they're, they're designed to work hand in hand. And I'm not seeing a lot of reporting in the media that points that out, but they are. One of them deals with the, um, it, the it's what's called the EAA. It was an organization set up uh, by the governor's office to have some authority 
uh, over the lowest 5% uh, performing school districts in the state of Michigan, primarily in the Detroit area, but not only there. Um, uh, there was a philosophy of how those schools could be reorganized, what kind of contracts they had to follow, what kind of teaching methodology they'd be expected to employ in those buildings. But that kind of uh, restructuring of those schools for the EAA schools has only been operating now for a few months since the start of this school year. What one of these bills wants to do is codify in law that the organization of that EAA group be now put into school law and that it apply to other districts beyond that potentially, beyond that 5% group, or as other schools fall into that. That does not exactly create a fair or level playing field for all school districts because these two bills also point out that there are other ways that schools can be established. And I think Linda's going to get into some of that as she gets into the mid, uh, what's called the Oxford Report, the Michigan Public Schools Plan X. We don't call it an act, it's a proposal. Michigan Public Education Finance Act project. <laughs> what I want to point out to our community and to all of you as board members, these two bills, which some of our professional organizations from the uh, uh, Secondary School Principals Association to the Middle and Elementary School Association to MASA to MASB are asking people to get informed about these bills because they have the, the potential to substantially restructure how schools are financed and how they're formed and who can run them. And while I can appreciate the governor trying to open up high school education and saying let's create more choice with a school-wide uh, school, school of choice option, which is different than you have now because typically in your organizational meeting you adopt something called Section 105, which means we're going to participate in schools of choice. But then you also adopt a resolution that's called Section 105C. What that does is say for a district that wants to send a student to us or their parents want to attend here that don't reside, if it's a special needs student, what 105C says is unless we can work out a contractual agreement on how to cover the cost for what could be um, heavy costs associated with some special education students, if we can't agree to that between the sending district and us, you don't have to agree to take that student. There's no reference to that kind of language in the Finance Act that they're proposing here or in the two laws we're talking about. Now, some people are saying it's going to take a few years for this whole thing to be sorted out and implemented, but I can tell you MASA thinks this is on a fast track, and they think that either the House or the Senate could act on some of these bills this week. I sent all of you a copy of a letter that I drafted to Senator Molinar. The same letter went to Representative Stamas. They really need to hear from our board, from you as individuals, from people in the community, from our building administrators. Um, while I can appreciate what the governor's trying to do to create more options, it, um, my personal feeling is he's trying to let the free market system drive the kind of choices that are out there for families. And while I believe over time that can make a difference, these are not widgets we're dealing with here. These are children. And if you have a family or some students that make a poor choice for an option other than what we would offer or a school district we have confidence in, they could take advantage of that choice, say, for a year or for three semesters, a year and a half, <coughs> find out that they've made a poor choice. Those students come back, and we're left kind of holding the bag here. And so there's some real dangers involved in this if it's not better thought out than what is presented now. It's going to take some time to go through the finance proposal and understand these laws. I've not gotten a return phone call from either of our uh, legislators on this issue. If I don't, by tomorrow, I'm going to call them personally. Linda and I had some discussion today about is it possible to get them in to meet with us by Friday, hoping that that's not too late if they take action on these bills. So you know what? There is a re-imaging, uh, reimagining of public education involved in what the governor would like to see happen here. I'm not opposed to that. I just think it needs to be done with the same level of accountability, with some um, uh, oversight for quality, which right now exists with the control that you have locally. These bills and this Finance Act clearly lessen control at the local level. So in terms of accountability, fair playing field, and quality, I think there are some legitimate questions about some of this legislation that's moving its way through. 
and as an astute school district, and some of you are as good as some of us as administrators of making those points with our legislators. I think we need to get their attention in the next day or two. Okay. Thank you. I'd like you to picture a stool, three legs. The top would have a label that says education reform in Michigan. And right now there appear to be three distinct legs that are all being considered to support that top of the stool. The first is House Bill 5923, and these are important to understanding what we call the Oxford Foundation Report because it actually makes reference to some of these other pieces. But 5923 is currently in legislation right now. It's in the lame duck session. And its purpose is to increase parental choice. That's really what it's all about. And it authorizes new forms of schools and expands the number and types of public entities that are permitted to authorize, supervise, operate, manage, and oversee public schools. So any of the following would be authorized under 5923. And by the way, any of these could have an alternate governance body. They would not have to have an elected board of education. The law actually calls for uh, setting up different types of governance bodies that, as long as they receive approval at the state level. There could be international schools that are put together in cooperation with education authorities in other countries. There could be municipal schools run by city or county or township governments. Uh, there could be employer-sponsored schools run by one or multiple employees. Uh, there could also be schools that are run by cultural organizations. Detroit Institute for the Arts, locally, Midland Center for the Arts, Chippewa Nature Center, uh, any of those would be permitted. So that's all called for under 5923. Now an interesting component of that is that also in 5923, these schools are given the latitude to either employ or contract with their personnel Currently, you know that we have to contract directly with our teachers. We can't contract with a third party for instruction. Uh, and they create a new category that is called adjunct faculty. An adjunct faculty would go through a certification process at the state, but wouldn't necessarily be a certified teacher. They'd be limited to teach no more than two classes, uh, and only in some subject if areas because the law is very clear that they wouldn't meet the highly qualified standards of the federal no child left behind but in a nutshell that's 5923 so that's one leg of the school or one leg of the stool creating a new category of all kinds of different schools they could be single gender uh, they could have selective enrollment they you know very very different from currently what's permitted uh, just to charter schools or public school academies. Second leg of the school stool is Senate Bill 1358 and House Bill 6004. This also amends the revised school code. And as Mr. Ellinger mentioned, the stated purpose is to broaden the scope of the Education Achievement Authority. However, you dig far enough into the 48 pages or so of the proposed law you find language that would make any district's unused school buildings available to a public school academy, an authorizing body for a public school academy, the achievement authority, or a university school. So all these other schools that I just mentioned, there's a process by which they would be able to use our buildings. They would have to either lease or purchase at fair market value but we wouldn't have the option of saying, no, we want to hold on to that building for a while because we're not sure what we want to do with it or we want to turn it into something else. No, we have to maintain it for a period of four years in a classroom-ready state so that after two years, if we haven't claimed it, then it's on the open market in essence. So leg one, new schools. Leg two, facilities all over. And then that takes us to leg three, which is the Michigan Public Education Finance Project, known colloquially as the Oxford Foundation Report. And the Oxford Foundation is a nonprofit foundation based in Lansing 
that was asked by the governor to put together a complete new funding model for schools, or to rewrite the revised school, or not the revised school code, the State School Aid Act, to put into place the uh, areas that he identified as his priorities back in his education address in 2011. So that gets us to the report that was released in draft form a week ago today. They are taking comments on it through December 14 with the hope that after those comments have been incorporated, they'll present a revised draft to the governor by Christmas, and then it's up to the governor to decide how much, if any, he wants to incorporate in his budget message, which typically gets presented at the beginning of February. And that point, we're into the legislative process, and typically the governor presents his version of school funding, and then the House and the Senate each weigh in on that. So there's a lot of places for uh, changes to occur, but this is the very first place to be able to offer input, and we only have until December 14 to do that. So it's renamed the School Aid Act of 1979, became the Michigan Public Education Finance Project, and the purpose is to create a public education funding system that allows a student to learn, this is the, the buzzwords right now, anytime, any place, any way, and any pace, and, now this is a direct quote, create the path toward more robust performance-based funding. Hence the change in the funding. And right at the beginning of the act, it states that the primary purpose is for Michigan schools to prepare career-ready citizens who have seamless transitions from preschool to K-12 to post-secondary to careers, promotes individual learning styles, gives parents and pupils options, and provides greater access to self-paced programs. So as I go through the components of it, you will hear those different goals addressed. And one of the keys is that it removes district ownership of the pupil. It's no longer a Midland Public Schools pupil and separates the educating from the enrolling functions. And this is just fascinating. I made for myself a little T-chart that said educating at the top of one column and enrolling. Educating doesn't have to do much other than produce results. Enrolling districts shall, so none of this is optional, and if a district or if a student enrolled in Midland Public Schools, this is what we would have to do. We'd have to verify that the pupil's a resident of the state. We would have to identify eligibility for any special programs, such as special education. Uh, we have to maintain their records. We have to provide counseling on all the options available to them. We have to be the provider of data to CEPI, the Center for Educational Performance Information. Uh, we have to grant the diplomas. We have to accept the credits from all of these other entities. We have to allow coursework at any of these other places. Uh, we also have to administer pupil growth and assessment tools, although there's a footnote that recognizes that this might be better left to the educating district. And I can see circumstances where it would make more sense in one place or the other. Uh, we also have to administer the Michigan Merit Exam. And for all of this, we would receive a categorical of $20 per pupil, or roughly $160,000 for you know, currently the number of students. Now this is the part that's really quite interesting to me. This is optional. We could directly offer courses. As I read this, we wouldn't have to. We could completely give that part up uh, because we could also enter into contracts with other districts or any of these other entities to provide the courses, or we could just allow our students who enroll with us to go somewhere else. Very, very interesting. And this applies K-12. This is not just a high school program. This is K-12. Uh, and then either one of us may act as the fiscal agent. And I'll get into a little more detail on that in a minute. So you can see a completely different shift in what is the role of a local public district. Uh, it does create a funding model in which the funding follows the pupil. And 
it changes the two count days to an average daily membership where we look at how many students are enrolled in Midland Public every single day. We add all that up and divide by however many days of instruction we have. That generates 85% of the foundation. It, the part that I'm unclear on is we provide a lot of services or programs to our local parochial schools. For this to work, I would think they would have to report daily membership as well. So it's just a little operational aside that popped into my head saying, hmm, I wonder how that would work and whether the parochials would really be capable of, of dealing with that. 10% uh, of the funding would still be based on the previous February count, so there would still be one official count day. And then 5% would be based on what's called the performance count. And the performance count takes place in two parts. There's a baseline score at the beginning of the year, and then there's a growth score administered. Remember what I said about districts having to administer the assessments? A growth score er, determined at the end of the year, and we would receive 5% of the foundation only for those students who attained at least a year's growth. Now, operationally, I'm thinking about what this means budget-wise because the language says that this, I, I, I guess it assumes that all students will grow a year because it says that if at the end of the year that number is less than 100%, you then have to pay it back, which says to me we either need a strong fund balance to protect this in June, or we would always need to deliberately budget to spend less than the foundation just to hedge our bets on students who, who didn't make a year's growth. And this all assumes full implementation of computer adaptive student growth assessment tools, which currently are uh, scheduled to go into place in 14-15. So for the 13-14 year, it maintains the current performance incentive that's in the existing language, and this piece of it would go into place in 14-15 because it can't be done with the, the existing systems. Uh, it also creates online earning options, and those are funded a little differently. They have performance funding. Days and hours don't apply for the online learning. And we as the district are permitted to say no to a pupil on online learning if the pupil has already gained credit for that somewhere else in one of these options. Uh, or if we feel that the program doesn't allow the pupil to achieve academic growth, or if it's inconsistent with the remaining graduation requirements. Otherwise, we permit it. And the online provider gets 50% when the student enrolls, 40% when they demonstrate proficiency, or 50% if they demonstrate mastery, and that's as determined by the course syllabus, which has to meet some state guidelines. It also creates an incentive for students to graduate up to four semesters early. There's a $2,500 per semester capped at $10,000 for students who complete all of the credit requirements of the Michigan Merit Standard. So you could have students who are ready for college at the end of their sophomore year. So instead of being a K-12, we might be a K-10 system if all of our students wanted to do that. Uh, those are the big issues that seem to be getting a lot of play right now. They're, they're in the news. You might have read some things about them. I identified a few other issues that I think are important to us internally that just aren't on the radar, but uh, equally important. And there, this puts a huge burden on CEPI. That's the state clearinghouse for data. And they will, it says, will begin to generate some of the reports that they currently require us to. And that they're supposed to consolidate reports and reduce the reporting burden. You can tell there's a flip side of this. There's another reporting burden. Uh, and that they have to ensure that their data system will give parents access to their students' individual disaggregated data. There's a very good statement in all of this about the current data systems and the current um, evaluation systems are very district and school oriented. 
because the data does not really exist to measure student growth. This throws all that out. I don't know what it'll mean for the various uh, programs that the Bureau of Assessment and Accountability has, but this throws all that out and makes it a student growth model, but puts the burden on CEPI to be able to do that and to make that data available to parents because remember one of the key components here is parental choice and choice requires good information. A uh, piece that I thought was interesting is it changes the foundation allowance for districts that consolidate after January 1, 2014. Currently, as a result of some shenanigans, for lack of a better word, that some districts tried a few years ago, uh, the current language is that two districts who consolidate, if they don't have the same foundation allowance, there's a weighted average. So if District A has 100 students at $8,000 and District B has 100 students at $7,500, everybody doesn't get $8,000, they get 100 times 8 plus 100 times 75 divided by 200. Uh, this turns that on its head and says that the uh, foundation allowance would be that of the highest district. Being the highest foundation district in miles around, you can see why this would be interesting to me. Uh, there's also a footnote on that page that says, advice from state budget office, question mark. So I don't know whether that one will last or not because you, I'm sure, are doing the math in your head too and saying, well, what would happen if Midland Public became Midland County? Certainly that would mean something different for the other students. Right now it's never been a feasible model because there's no more money for the county. This would bring huge amounts more money, none more for Midland, but what certainly if, for the other What if Midland became Bloomfield Hills? <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I don't know if there's any requirement that the districts have to be contiguous. It seems like there might be something there. Uh, it also seems to maintain the current financial best practice incentive, and I'm now serving on a statewide group that's offering some input on this, and so I sent off some of these questions to my contact to say, am I reading this correctly? Because this seems to be there. Uh, it does seem to have the financial best practice incentive, and that's the one about uh, being the policyholder and you know, um, participating in schools of choice, et cetera. So that's still there. Uh, it provides $10 per pupil for districts that decide to operate schools with no more than a two-week break year-round. You don't have to offer more days, but can't offer more than a two-week break. And if they do that, they get an extra $10. Uh, and then, as Mr. Ellinger mentioned, it opens up non-resident school of choice to the entire state, wiping out that whole section on 105C, which refers to contiguous ISDs. And my concern with that one is, as you heard, around the special education funding. I'd always assumed that that language was there about the added cost because of, going back to the early discussion of the millage, our taxpayers pay special education millage. And district students coming in from other districts are, we're not getting a portion of that millage. And so that strikes me as just wrong for, for that to happen. Uh, so I think what you need to begin to mull over in your head is thinking about how this would affect our students, our community, our taxpayers, our employees, and then the organization as a whole because we'll have some decisions that we need to make and we need to decide where we stand on this and sort of separate out what are the conceptual concerns or areas of support versus the operational. Because a lot of the operational, honestly, can probably be dealt with pretty easily. Uh, just reading the press accounts, that you know, a lot of people came right out of the shoot just negative from the get-go. There's been a few others who said, yes, thank goodness, this is what we need. Uh, it's probably not productive to say, no, we hate it, no way, no how, without being able to explain what it is that we find troubling or what it is that we might find that we would support. 
And then the real question is to think about what would this mean that MPS would look like if, if this were to come to pass. So in a nutshell, that's the 300 plus act. It is out there on multiple websites. The format is such that they took the current state school aid act, any <coughs> new languages in bold, any omitted language is strike through. So it's very easy if you're going through to see the change. Anything that's just plain text is no change from existing law. And they stayed away from putting numbers in. And they, they're very upfront about that, that they didn't see that as their role. Uh, they also did not really get into the areas of early childhood, didn't feel that was their mission, or special education. And I think that's a tougher one to separate out from the broader issue of student and parent choice as well as school district funding. And they did indicate right from the get-go when they released the report that they anticipated there would be modifications to it. But it's on a fast track if you look at December the 14th and the fact that there's both a House and a Senate bill that tracks along with this worries me because uh, it, it, it gives the impression that there's a little more coordinated, coordinated effort other than an independent Oxford Foundation working on this and then the legislature having an opportunity to take it, massage it, make changes. It looks like there's a little more coordination there. Board's pleasure, probably many questions, and this is a good place to ask questions tonight. This is a good place to spend time. Jeff. Linda, any uh, indication how it would uh, impact districts uh, that are known as the 20J district, and then what transportation could look like because Right now we don't send school buses into other districts, and I don't know if that's a cordial or a, I don't know, sort of a handshake agreement right now, but not to do that. But. That is very much uh, left up to the locals. And this does not address anything about transportation other than transportation would not be required, and that's one of the concerns that you're, you're reading in the popular press is that all these choices really would only be available to those students whose parents are able to get them there. That's a key point because I think that a lot of parents and families make decisions based off of what is convenient, local, and so forth, and the amount of time that's required mm -hmm. for transportation and so They're taking some so heat forth. from that issue even today during the day. The, the Oxford Foundation released a press release on it, John. I just read it actually before the board meeting. And their retort to that is for students that were physically going to go somewhere else, they understand transportation is still a challenge. But there are so many online um, options that that's their retort to that to make transportation a non-issue. My only issue with that as an educator is almost all the research about online instruction would tell you it's still totally dependent upon the quality of the teacher doing the online instruction, number one. And number two, our experience with some of our students, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Ellison, is that when a lot of students sign on for Michigan Virtual University, I've seen this even personally with some of our E2020, not every student, especially those that might come from a disadvantaged status, can handle online learning well, without a lot of help, a lot of tutorial help. So I'm not sure that that's the right answer mm -hmm. to, well, transportation's a non-issue sure. because sure. those other options are there. I, you know, I think that learners are different. You know, some might do better in that. Uh, some might need the hand-holding. And then Linda, the 20J? Is they that really did not address the 20J issue. They left the distinction in foundations. It looks as if uh, for the time being, we would still have differential foundations, and we would be levying our hold harmless millage, as would some of the other districts. Uh, it really did not address that side of the funding. It talks more about how the funding will now be distributed. Okay. And it didn't talk about us being able to do additional military no. like that. Okay. <laughs> no, although you, know, it, <laughs> we you, you just raised a good point. Early on in this process, uh, for reasons that were still aren't clear to me, the Oxford Foundation did release a rewrite of the language around the enhancement millage. And that, because it's not uh, State School Aid Act, that's in the revised school code. I don't know what the intent is to do with that, but that came out fairly early and completely different model for how the enhancement millages are levied and distributed. Still calls for equalizing across areas, 
but it would allow individual districts to levy them, just not to get more. So you would no longer have to have complete agreement across an ISD. And I, I don't know what's happening with that, but that is out there as one of the pieces that they addressed. Thank you. Next. Really? I just find it scary. It, it, yeah. it, it is overwhelming. And revolutionary and yep. all the years people talk about how the public school system doesn't change. You know, go back to the Riffin Weekly days and nothing ever changes. And this is uh, pretty dramatic. Yeah. yeah, pretty dramatic. Yeah, I'm just Short trying to envision because they're so, Michigan's so diverse. What does this mean in the Detroit area? And it means something so totally different in the Upper Peninsula where people are so much, you know, further spread apart. And someone today <coughs> brought up a good point to me at work about this just this whole online learning thing. Just a, another point that, you know, who thought, they're like, what's the age that children are, alone, are allowed to stay home alone? Because so many, you know, people with working parents and we're pushing online learning now, can kids stay home and do online learning if they're nine? You know, is that an option? How is that monitored? You know, that kind of thing. Just, you know, all these little things that you don't even think about. Yeah. When you, uh, you, you know, once you really start to think about what this could look like, right. you, you, you could just go on forever. You know, also think about what does this mean for extracurricular activities mm -hmm. and for athletics. I'm sure at some point the Michigan High School Athletic Association is going to have to weigh in on this because we could have Midland public students were their enrolling district, but are they really Midland public students? Well, they'd have to rethink our whole model of who participates in what. And if your students are gone after your sophomore year, what's junior senior prom? <laughs> And, and just before we lose the opportunity to have either five or six of our uh, students leave us tonight that are here, I, I'm just kind of curious because sometimes we as adults think we want to make all these decisions on your behalf and we forget that many of you are 17 or 18 and you may want to weigh in on this yourself. How many of you were intrigued by the idea of capturing $2,500 per semester up to two years worth, eight semesters? that you could apply to college and then head off to college uh, your sophomore year. Just raise your hand, or is that a little scary? Would you be ready for that? Well, I think they're all sophomores. Oh, you're all sophomores? Okay, well, there you go. I'm almost ready to go. Just so our audience knows, I mean, all five of them raised their hand, so they're intrigued by that. I think that's good for us to know. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that says something that we shouldn't ignore. You know, now, the parents may not be ready for that, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but they or, are. Or more than ready. Linda, I spent some time to that, and, and not super thoroughly, because it is voluminous. And I would just make a few comments that I will be talking to Representative uh, Stamas and Senator Molinar about. One, fundamentally, rush legislation tends to be bad legislation. And uh, however you care about it, I don't want this bill to become like Obamacare where you've got to pass it to read it. And this ought to be known well in advance what we're going down and the public ought to understand it and there better be an overall consensus by, by the state of Michigan on where this is going versus just a get it done quick, cram it, and now let's go figure out how we're going to manage this because it just will have warts on it uh, if you do that, just philosophically. Number two, I'm hugely concerned that if we're going to be an enrolling district and our students are free to take classes anywhere, fine, no problem with that. Even if they're state approved classes, no problem with that. But if we're then held accountable for their, lack of a better word, meet performance, why can't I be responsible to veto what classes they can take? Now, you indicated we may have some veto rights on that. That's and just online. Yeah. That yes, online. Veto. And I, exactly, the online. But I'm hugely concerned that we're going to be held responsible uh, both publicly and financially for students' performance that we are not educating. That, that bothers me fundamentally. Now, I heard you talk about who's responsible, the educating entity or the enrolling entity. And it gets interesting to me how that's going to sort itself out. Because if I take two online courses and take four courses at Midland Public Schools and my performance in a certain subject area is deficient, yet higher another, what does that mean? No one, no, this bill, the way I sorted through it, can't tell me what this means. So if you're going to hold us, if you're going to, I don't mind the accountability and the responsibility. I love it. Bring it on. 
if we're, if we're scared of that, then shame on us. Uh, bring it on. But don't let me not have the hand on the knob to control the car if you're going to tell me I'm going to get the speeding ticket. That, that's just another point I'll be making tomorrow. That, that's bothersome to me that, uh, that that's there. There has to be a better mechanism if you're going to allow someone to go out and take seven eighths or 100 percent of their classes somewhere else and somehow because of how it's categorized hold us accountable then i want hands on that knob okay uh so that that's my and the special ed one is one i did not pick up on so thank you that's a big one that could get very expensive very quickly lastly that that's the concern side but on the positive side with every change there's opportunity and the ones I see right off the bat are, huh, if we're that good, why aren't we the online provider? Yeah. And what can we do there to be the online provider of classes and courses? And there are startup companies out there, which I'm personally familiar, that are in business or trying to be in business to do this very service for entities called school districts, colleges, whatever. So there's an opportunity that's there uh, that's, that could be very exciting. Um, number two, the consolidation. Um, it could make us more efficient, offer things up. Uh, it, we could structure this in a way that that leaves local, to some degree, local autonomy. And perhaps when you answer all these questions about sports and community-based schools and all that, but can you administratively do some things that would save everybody a lot of money and provide a lot more offerings to a lot more kids? I, I think that's exciting. That clears the way from a traditional barrier of oops, there's going to be a financial hit here in aggregate if something happens. And then third, um, the ability to contract for certain educational services and meaning either online courses uh, or other things is exciting because it opens up a new avenue of things that might be available to us that have not historically been available. And as time goes on, they may be more readily available out there that uh, would open our horizons to what we offer and not offer from universities, uh, from uh, some of these other new ones that are cropping up. There's opportunity there, could be, could be plus. But overall, I see opportunities, I see huge dangers, and I see a rush to passing that could make it bad only because it's a rush. And uh, you know, to say you've got four days to comment, it's only been out, the re draft report's been only out, what, uh, two weeks? One week. One week. One week. Week you know, we've had one week to do, was that, that soon ago? Was it all, that's all it was ago? Gosh, yeah. it seems longer than that. But to, to know that it's only been out that long and say, oh, we're going to pass bills behind this just like that is, is really troublesome. So that's my comment. A lot for you to think about, no. for sure, okay. in our community. Yeah. And for anyone who cares to offer input, the Oxford Foundation's website makes it very easy. You can go to their website. You can read the full report, summary of the report. There's a whole section on just a summary of how we will count pupils. And they make it very easy to just put your feedback into a little box. So uh, students, parents, community members, anyone who wants to weigh in. Yep. Chime in. My problem is back to my first comment. About the time I keystroke, the legislature could have already decided. Yeah. OK, and that's, that's what's troublesome. It, is, it, it sounds like a, a, a cram it in issue, and we got to make sure it's not a cram it in issue. And I have no fear of any of this. As a matter of fact, I see tons of opportunities for good school districts, very many. And uh, But I just want it thought through versus instantaneously adapted. Going back all the way to the legislation that deals with expanding the powers and the authority of the EAA, Jerry, people are saying, I mean, I can't, I don't know if I'm a career, in my career, I can ever think of a time where something fundamentally new like that for how schools could be run was only allowed to run for less than a semester and somebody wanted to codify yeah. it into law already. Yeah. And of course the governor's response is we've been patient enough for our worst performing schools, which frankly doesn't apply to us. Um, so I understand the frustration that's driving what the change that he'd like to see happen. But when the implications are for districts like us mm -hmm. that have a history of having very good sure. academic achievement not that we're not perfect, I mean, or that we're perfect, we're not, and we know where our gaps are and so on, and we have some work to do. But when what was working for a very targeted audience all of a sudden gets codified and it has an impact on all the rest of the school districts in the state of Michigan, 
that meets my definition of what I think you're saying is rushed legislation. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. It's going to be flashbacks for Proposal A. Yes, I, yeah, and, yeah. and that had more time to digest, it and it, it still had issues. And, and without digestion, uh, you just get bad legislation. It, it's just a principle of legislation that rushed legislation tends to be bad legislation because um, not everything is heard, not all, not all inputs there, not all things are considered. We've learned that as a school board, you know, school closings. You know, we could have just said, boom, but nope, we took the time, get a lot of information, collect a lot of information, get a lot of input, come to a better decision than you can just instantaneously and quickly. So that'll be my main message back to uh, John and, uh, and Jim. Okay, any more on that? Okay, moving on. Uh, International Baccalaureate uh, PYP and new tech budget presentations. I'll hand it over to Carl. Uh, we promised the board that we would bring to this meeting um, budget numbers uh, for both an expansion um, well, for a potential new tech program and for a potential expansion of the International Baccalaureate um, program for the primary years. And so I want to share some budget numbers with you. I want to share with you that um, we still have requests um, and interest from outside parties, but no firm commitments up to this point. I'm hoping that we might be able to bring something to you by a December meeting. But what I'm going to show you Without a commitment of outside funding, other than general fund dollars, um, we can't afford to do. I know that as your superintendent, I wouldn't bring a recommendation to you without that additional source of revenue. What we're looking at here is we'll start with new tech um, and talk about budget projections. And we've had to break this down into a number of slides more than we really wanted to. So it's hopefully view viewable for those of you on TV, certainly those of you who are close enough to see the TV here. You see personnel costs that are spread all the way from what costs we're assuming this year um, all the way through the 2017-2018 year. And as we amass, if we were to do this, 100 students per year, beginning with a freshman class, potentially for the 13-14 school year, you see that would require uh, what's, lift, what's listed down the left-hand column, five teachers per year, uh, special ed services, uh, adding two teachers eventually to that program. And the cost we're sharing with you about teachers and staffing here are total costs. They're not just salaries. They include, you know, FICA retirement, the insurance, um, what we call total cost compensation. Uh, full-time administrator, full-time office professional. Custodial cost estimated right now to be 80000 That number could be mitigated a bit, but we're trying to put numbers in that are conservative that would cover the cost. So it wouldn't be anything more than this, but there are places... Uh, and I'll point them out to you where costs could go down. And because this program is so heavily um, uh, um, involved in technology, it would require at least part-time commitment from a technology staff person, which we am, would anticipate to be about $20,000 a year. The cost that you see on the first row below the years should be a wash because as you bring those students out of the high schools, let's say 50 from each high school, there should be a downturn of an equal cost uh, from not staffing the high schools at a level as if they did have each of them the extra 50 students. Uh, we have blanks by counseling and instructional support because right now we don't anticipate any necessary instructional support like pair pros and for counseling until we have enough students in the program and we know exactly what that's going to require. We don't have anything there. We don't know if the counselors in the ex existing high school could counsel the kids. We're still working on that. When you look at fees, there is a new tech fee uh, for this year based on training and the commitments that we have by indicating to them that we might be able to launch as early as the fall of 13. Our $57,000 out of this year's budget, and then there are 103750 for the next four years, and then they drop off in the 17-18 year, which would really be the fifth year of operations. Uh, for technology, you can see what the costs are. There's a one-to-one -one computing arrangement for a new tech program. We anticipate that that would cost roughly $130,000 for every 100 students you bring in. We think in year five, the laptops, which is probably what we're looking at, could still be used for another year. So we looked at maintenance or replacement costs, and that's why that figure in 17-18 is $100,000 less than the previous four years. You see the insurance, peripheral devices, and instructional supplies. 
This should get us to a total page here in just a bit. There's training and program development. There is a leadership residency required for your people that are planning the program. Um, uh, costs even coming out of this year's budget, which f we have budgeted for from general fund dollars. Uh, there are teacher shadowing and new school training costs. When you get down to an annual conference, it's really important for the teachers in this program to attend the annual conference because that's where they get their PD. That's where they get to interface with other teachers in the new tech program from across the country. For the last couple of years, the annual conference has been in Grand Rapids. There's no guarantee it always will be, but we think we put enough money in there to cover the cost irrespective of where it would be. And then there are regional conferences for the director and the staff and then program exploration visits. Uh, we've spent about 20000 or we will by the time we're done with, with our visits this year. Furniture upgrades. Uh, this might look a little on the high side, although Linda says that she's looked into this a little bit more. She thinks this is a uh, pretty good number because this is not the kind of program that you just move furniture out of an old building into. It has a different look to it. By design, it is supposed to. It should frankly look more like a business and a workspace for creativity and innovation than it does really a typical um, school, high school building. This is a program we'd anticipate locating it in the central middle school. We're going to talk a little bit about what the survey would tell. There's some community interest in potentially supporting that, but we think the furniture costs are going to be in the range of about a uh, quarter million dollars over four years. Uh, you look at building renovations, I'm going to come back to that later. Uh, transportation costs, right now this program is designed so if a student wanted to spend their entire day in the program, we've staffed it so that can happen. <coughs> a lot of the programs we went to, um, of course, can't offer the full complement of classes for a student. So it's not uncommon to have students start their day for the first two periods in their respective high schools and come to this program for the last four or five periods of the day or they may start the day in the program but end the day for electives in the high school and that allows then for uh, some extracurriculars, the <coughs> music and, and band program, uh, the kind of things that we think are the elective classes that our students would still have an interest in. <coughs> but if we were going to have a split program like that, we'd be running shuttles and we anticipate the cost of those shuttles to be a little less than $21,000. When you look at curriculum development, this is teacher planning and time cost. There's some investment for the 12-13 year, uh, primarily for work <coughs> during the summer. And then you can see that in July and August, that were to continue in the future years at a cost of about um, uh, $5,100. Take your attention to the very bottom row and you look at $2,936,820. That number can be mitigated. Uh, we have had an outside funder that we have requested take a look at funding uh, 1.5 million of that. We have a proposal that we're speaking to another funder that would take on really all these costs but the staffing for teachers in the very first row that I pointed out to you. So we would anticipate with outside funding that our ongoing costs would be in the range of six to seven hundred thousand dollars a year. But doesn't that bottom line include the teacher costs that you said would be relatively neutral because of shift from the high schools? It does. It, it includes the cost, uh, the two point three million right there, Rick, on the top line. And you're assuming roughly that it's one teacher for twenty students. If I'm just maybe that's not exactly right, but uh, you know I don't have the ratio. I think it was one to twenty five. Just to say you're adding five hundred thousand right. dollars for every hundred students, so that's where I came out with it. Maybe it's not exactly that. It's six hundred or something. So yeah. okay. it's one to twenty five but it requires more than four teachers because under the teacher's contract, teachers teach five periods, students take six. Okay. So it so takes 20% more teachers for okay. Okay. the ratio. Okay, so let me understand. So if you go back to your total line, and in fact the, the incremental teacher costs are minimal, and then just quoting what you thought might be possible from outside funders, I'm struggling to come up with what that incremental, whatever it was, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars would be. Right. It's the difference between that two point three million and the two point nine million you're looking at there. Two point three million would be I mean, that's a wash because that's those Correct. five staff members. Correct. But then if you have Every some external funding to right to make up the difference, therefore we potentially would not have incremental cost to our general fund budget. Uh, we would after right. th I, I'm saying after the funding, because we have a one and a half million okay. in to an outside funder here. One that once that runs out, okay. the difference is the yeah, six hundred thousand okay. between those two numbers. That would be additional cost to the budget. 
assume we get 100% efficiency on the teaching machine. Yeah. yeah. So if you have any questions, I mean, we're going to, we wanted to get this, these numbers out in front of you because if things were to move forward and the board could take action in concept contingent upon funding, we could be requesting that action at the December meeting. So if you have questions about this, think about it. Either ask them yet tonight or uh, let us know and we'll try to get those questions answered uh, by our December 10th board meeting. Well, while we're here, you know, what's, uh, versus going to PYP right away, uh, board members, if you have specific questions or comments on new tech right now, it'd be a good time to make them, I think. Just from a financial risk standpoint, if we're able to get that outside funding and when that time period comes, when it runs out, and then you have that incremental financial burden, if you will, on our fund budget, and you're in the midst of this, you're year one, two, three, four, wherever you are, or beyond that, um, not to say that you can't always go back, but it'd be hard once you get to the point of no return. I mean, it's not like you can implement for two years and decide we can't afford it. And if we end up with financial challenges, again, in terms of the bottom line, that's going to have to come from somewhere else. I mean, it could come from here. I'm just saying that it's a commitment kind of thing that you're really kind of investing in long term and a lot of likelihood, right? So it's just I just wouldn't argue that point. Yep. I, I would just say that sometimes timing is everything. And if we always wait for what could happen, we certainly have some recent evidence that we haven't really had the expenditures that we've had in recent years. This might be the ten dollar year this year. We know what deficit spending we're looking at for this year. I'm just looking at forward. That's yeah. all. The unknown. That's yeah. all. But I don't. Well, and I would only comment that a. I'm really excited about it because a, it's new vitality, new programs. It'll be the thing to help. Everything we just talked about, it's something that will help attract students and keep students to the district. Number two, if the long-term liability is indeed 700,000, 600,000 a year, that's, I won't say easily managed, but more easily managed than if it was a $2 million obligation a year. You know, maybe that's stating the obvious, but uh, as we go forward, hopefully we'd find a way to adroitly manage around that if we made the commitment. So I'm excited about the potential. I hope we find the outside funding to help us through. That would be great community support. And uh, who knows what this could grow to. You know, I know it's limited to 400 kids, and there's only be certain kids that are going to want to go this path, and that's great. But when we talked about opportunities, we talked about contracting to others with the new potential state law, this is something we could be offering to others. And, and I uh, think in terms of attractiveness to outside funders, probably the more that we could claim that this is a regional initiative, yes. uh, the more likely we are to excite them about helping get it off the ground. Exactly. I and, and uh, you know, not to be, good gosh, I hate to be this exuberant, but uh, bear with me. If this thing were to grow, what do we, we envision Central can handle, what, two programs of this size, two 400s? In terms of uh, physical no, probably space, probably in terms of capacity. Okay. We, yeah, I don't want to give people the impression that we've no. got a plan to make right. that happen. I want to make exactly. We're, we're hoping just to get to the 400. We'd be right. we'd be ecstatic, right. but we have room to grow in that same building, and then we'd have the other buildings. To the point Linda was making, if it ever grew that much, as another uh, venue. Is there any assumptions we would make here on the conservative side? Obviously, relative to potential incremental students in terms of attractiveness of this program coming to our district. I think we would make uh, some of our surrounding districts nervous. Um, you know, we've never really, and this is true for most school districts, typically you don't directly go after another school district students. Okay. I'm but if that were a step toward, for example, some of you may be aware from your publications and listservs that they had a consolidation down in the Washtenaw ISD. I believe it was Willow Run and Ypsilanti that combined um, it took a vote of the people. They voted it. Um, there's a difference between consolidating and annexing, and a lot of that has to do with which contract covers the cost and so on. Um, but could something like that, if this were a step that proved that that kind of partnership, Rick, and that we're not really going after somebody's students, but it's something that's good for all students, uh, could it be a step in that direction? That's an opportunistic way to look at it for sure. It can also be much like a parallel of a regional, I hate to call it, voc ed center where your home, your home school is your home and you come here for your afternoon classes or vice versa. So it affords a district to retain a student as a district student. They can enjoy all the, just like ours will, 
of you know there will be Dow High students, there will be middle and high students, there will be in middle and high extracurriculars, there will be in Dow High extracurriculars. The same could happen with adjoining districts. I believe what would happen, and I think there's some evidence around the country where this has been true, is if the program is successful based on its own merits. Mm -hmm. And what would those merits be? You know what? It's technology laden. It is very steeped in project-based learning. Frankly, sh so should a lot of our other um, instruction in any school district around the country be based in what's called PBL. Uh, the difference is when you have, for example, high schools as large as ours, it is hard to create a system that every teacher sees value in that they use for projects and how you assess them and how you get the business uh, representatives in to give students feedback on real projects. This is a program that systematizes good instructional practice. And if that works and it draws, we'll know because we'll have requests for more than 100 students trying to get into a class. And it, that'd be a great, I'd love to have, have that, that problem, problem in a few years. Do we think that this is something that might bring some of our own students that we currently lose to, to go other places? Would this, could it be helpful in bringing them back? Or is there it's no speculation, way to know? It's but yeah, I don't think there's, there's, there's any no way, way to really to know. It's a great question. So Did we offered. lose any this year to Meridian? Yeah. Uh, no, but that really, I mean, if we did, it was just um, a, a two or three. I'm not aware. No one's told okay. me that we have, Angela. But Meridian was pretty direct that they were going to be tight on space already, mm -hmm. and it wasn't their intent. Now, I think they ended up, somebody told me, with like 27 or 29 more students than they anticipated. But I don't believe many of those were ours. Now, if anybody else has other information, you should share that. No one has shared with me that we lost people there. Uh, we had attempts by some of their parents to bring their students over here. Um, I think they uh, stuck to their guns, and, and if, if some of their parents didn't choose that option as part of school of choice, I don't think they were releasing because they wanted to get kids in that program. And a lot of what they were doing academically showed that this was going to be even a better fit for their students than what they had been practicing up to this point and they wanted their students and their families to get used to that for a year or two before someone would try it for half a semester or a marking period and then say, I want to bail on this. I don't think it's good for my child. Um, we'd be doing it for, I mean, they did the full high school conversion mm -hmm. because they thought it was a good fit. We're not talking about that here. Yeah, I think you just made a point, Carl, that you've said it, but it will be, I'll be more direct about it you are still a student of your home school. This is just a program that's remotely located from your home school. And you'll be based there for a good portion of the day. Yeah. Uh, you'll play your, you can play sports there, you can be in band there, you can be in drama there. You know, so it's just a remote mm -hmm. campus for certain classes. Yeah. Okay, can other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think in terms of this uh, report that Linda gave on the Oxford Foundation, I kind of look at what's coming uh, down the road. Innovators, I think, are going to be winners in the future landscape. And, um, you know, I think about 21st century learning, and it's, um, I think we're going to have to innovate to grow and to stay strong as a district. Uh, it's a gutsy thing to do, and you know, I think it is going to, like Carl, you had said that a lot of innovative schools are offering programming. It's not, not just AP, but there's other options that are there. So. Um, I think we have to look how to grow and keep our vitality. Being exactly the same, I don't think we're going to stay in, and be able to keep there. And if I look at what's coming down the road, kind of the writing's on the wall to do new things and innovate. Well, there's the old maxim, you don't get to stay the same. You either grow or you die. Yep. And, uh, That's what I'm thinking. Better to be on that side of the coin. Yeah. Okay, okay, we'll move on to uh, uh, new, uh, PYP, right? Yes, it's the uh, PYP that we talked to the board uh, about, I think, was it just two weeks ago? I, I can't remember if it was a month ago or, or month two ago, weeks right? ago, a month ago. Um, what you see here are um, our fees and costs associated with this. As I march through the next three or four slides, what I want you to keep in mind are the costs for the four columns in the middle because that's what we're looking for an offset of when we get to those totals. Um, if we were to expand and the board again in December were to make a conceptual approval to move forward with this contingent upon money, frankly, if we were to do a new TEP program in the fall, the board's going to have to say, go ahead and do it. 
and we're going to have to know really in December or no later than the first meeting in January that we've got the funding in place or the whole thing goes on hold for uh, uh, perhaps a year. And people look to see what's happening economically in the community. That could be an option. Uh, we have a little more time with this just because it takes a few years to become implemented and Kathy's much more articulate about that, Dr. Ellison is, than I am. But what I want to point out to you are the costs that we have. There's a candidacy fee of $4,000 for three buildings that would be due April 1st of the 13-14 school year if we were to go down this path. You can see what that is. It's just 4,000 times four more buildings coming on the uh, following year to begin the application process. It's not like when you see 13-14 and 14-15 that instantly the elementary buildings have become an IB program. It doesn't happen that way. It takes, what, two or three years, Dr. Ellison? Two years to uh, get there. You see a candidacy fee uh, of $9,500 uh, for three buildings that is due December 1st. Uh, when you have seven buildings, of course, the total of that then is going to be 665. And then there's authorization visits uh, for fees of 3,500 for three buildings. This will make a little more sense as I get to some of the subtotals of the columns. You can just see a continuation of that as it falls out to the future years. And you look down at the bottom and you see what those costs are up to this point. The ongoing uh, costs for this program after the initial startup and training because the majority of the cost associated with expanding this comes from training and travel and so on. There are some coordinators and we're going to get to that here. But we think the ongoing cost um, that we would project now would be between forty and sixty thousand dollars for this program. You see again out of the general fund for this year, and this money's been budgeted, uh, we've had people on the road and they're going to be traveling even yet um, here just in another couple of weeks. Uh, you see $34,000, a little over that for the current year. You see what those costs are again for three buildings, 90, I assume applies to the teachers, Kathy, uh, on this that would pay for $45,000 of training. And you can carry that all the way over and see the training costs again are beginning to um, accumulate in those inner four columns. Uh, programs without personnel costs, you can see for the 12-13 year, total of 34000 out of the general fund. A grant request um, of 57000 for next year, then it's almost 150000 137. <coughs> then it pairs off to where it's 60000 in the 17-18 school year. That's without personnel costs, and I'm going to get to the personnel cost here in a minute. Five-year program total without personnel, $520,000. We'll round it off. You see what the personnel costs are. There's a coordinator, a full-time coordinator for three buildings. Then we are budgeting, even though we can massage these numbers. We don't have to have um, uh, two full-time coordinators here. But if we had it for the seven buildings, you can see what those costs total to um, over to the right, what their cost is per year. Personnel subtotal, 130000 grows to 260000 Program totals with personnel, you see those totals on the bottom. If you add up that, I think this is our last one, if you add up the 187, the 409, the 397, and the 341, I think you see a figure uh, which is very close to what we anticipate needing outside funding for between 1.2 and 1.3 million there. If that money's not there, there is no way we can consider a serious expansion uh, of this program out into the uh, elementaries in the immediate future, I guess, is how I, I would phrase that. Questions, Questions about IB or things? anything you want to add, Dr. Ellison? Carl, the only question I would have, question slash concern, is will we have the institutional capability to absorb this between new tech change and and the PYP implementation being roughly all the same timing, do, do we have the capability in terms of these folks and a couple others that would be absorbed into both? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, I'll tell you how I've answered that for myself. I mean, the, the leadership for both these programs has come out of the curriculum division. And, and when you all made a decision to create a point person for new tech and Randy Shadig, mm -hmm. He's taken that on. We were able to bump his salary in a, <laughs> compared to the workload in a relatively minor fashion. But he has taken the lead, and New Tech has a great 
support network that they will walk you through. In fact, we have their regional representative uh, coming up and doing a public forum, uh, talking to uh, our parents, I believe it's next week, uh, December 3rd, if I remember correctly. And we sent flyers out to our middle school and our, our high school parents. Not that we're doing a program next year, but that it's, we want to get some feedback from them. We want to measure how much they understand about that, what their level of readiness might be, and we'll be prepared to bring that kind of feedback to you at our, at our next board meeting. But because of Randy's leadership and the core group of people that we've had working on this now for two years, with a lot of visits to California, to Indiana, to Texas, to here in Michigan, uh, Kathy passed on a spreadsheet today that was a tally of all the different folks that had gone on all these different visits, and it was impressive to see that. I think we've done all the work we could do independently on our own as a district, and now we're relying on the new tech resources to help us get ready for it. And they've got a pretty interesting process from developing the units. What we have to commit to is time for our staff to do it. I think if Randy were here, Dr. Ellison can weigh in, I think he would tell you absolutely we've got that piece down. Okay. Equally so, at least in my mind, because I haven't had anybody, Dr. Ellison included, tell me we could not take this on, is when you look at how well ingrained the IB program is at our high schools and the cadre of people that are big believers in that facilitation of the learning process, and they can see uh, the advantages and the applications of that even at the elementary. Remember the superintendent study committees that we've had where we looked into extracurriculars and music and um, drawing a blank, um, you know, the IB program, I forget what the fourth one was. That group has continued to meet since that first year and they've met for two years also now and they've launched themselves into a PYP, a middle years program as well as the diploma program. They've been actively working. And those, um, sub, those committees really have had representation of staff. Uh, they've had reputation of community members, uh, former parents of IB students. Uh, I think Kathy found a nice representation of those committees. Having heard all that, I'm not hearing anybody push back saying, you're asking us to do too much too quickly. We can't do it. In fact, uh, isn't to put pressure on all of you because we have to be astute to do it. I think they'd be disappointed if we didn't do it. You know, I feel the burden of that to help find the funding to make it happen. I think if we find the funding, it's a little easier for you as a board to buy in to the recommendation. Uh, in the absence of that, I think we have to be really careful, like I mentioned. Uh, I think both of those groups would be disappointed if we didn't move forward. Thank you. Is that fair representation? I think it is. I, I believe the answer to your question, I would say, is yes. Both these opportunities, both New Tech and PYP, have huge organizations behind them to provide the support. And here, I think we have some commitment. I would say, though, that it would be wise of us to maybe try to do some selective abandonment. I'm not sure. Maybe not be careful about the other new initiatives we might be interested in. As you say, there are many good things out there, and we need to select what matches for us, which is why I'm proud of our committee work. We've had 20 people each, maybe more, 30 people in these committees working monthly, and we've heard lots of positives coming from that, and they believe it is doable. We just need to be focused, and we need to stay focused on making these something that is a new, different, innovative approach for our students. Because if it's not going to result in additional or different kinds of student growth, then we'd have to question why we would want to do that. Very good. Your last point was very good. Okay. Um, right, before you move off that, though, uh, let me just share with you w what actually are some what we think. We, we have yet to see an executive summary of the Cobalt Communication Survey. Yeah. Uh, we had a verbal conference call with William St. Um, uh this morning at 1030. And... Um, yeah, I think we were, uh, I was a little nervous, you know, about what the results would be, and they really came back, and it was really outstanding. From Remember, we asked some benchmark questions, you know, that uh, could benchmark us against other municipalities and major industries. It was part of that American Society of Customer Satisfaction Index, I think is uh, what it was called. It, um, it, it came back, according to William this morning, with very strong support for us as a district for district leadership, 
for uh, the tradition of the public school system. Um, almost surprisingly so, even for good districts. Uh, when you look at uh, what he was explaining to us was the breakout of the percent uh, of our community that would support both a sinking fund, uh, as we stated in the survey here, and a bond. Uh, uh, right out of the gate, it was just a little bit less than 50% already, which was really unusual. When you looked at particular programs that um, uh, we got, we looked at a lot of data that showed how many people would support both initiatives, how many uh, would oppose, what percent would oppose, and what percent felt like they needed more information. Uh, often in that last column, um, uh, we asked him if it was reasonable to say if you could just move a third of those people that need more information into those that would support. If that was a reasonable, cautious way to look at it, William felt that it was. Uh, when you looked at the level of support uh, for passing both those initiatives, it looked really positive for us. We have some work to do. Now what gets included in asking for a sinking fund as well as a uh, technology bond will make all the difference in the world of what's included there. And uh, the support for uh, a sinking fund for maintenance and repair and so on in the way that we phrased it, I think the question was 1.27 mills, continue maintenance and repairs, including repairing roof, parking lots, heating, <coughs> ventilation, floors, plumbing, et cetera, improved energy efficiency. Uh, the number of people that felt strongly that that should be part of what you propose to the voters was like 80%, hmm. which probably isn't that big of a surprise to us when you think of the street. confidence, that's right, of the sinking fund and before that the PRME designation amount that was always um, uh, in the budget. Um, very strong support for STEM-related uh, initiatives. We asked a question about that. Uh, very strong support. Um, uh, uh, what was the other major area you guys got to help me out here? Uh, yeah, but not class size. Um, it was the, oh, it was about the new tech uh, uh, program. Strong support, even from those when we specifically identified a new tech program uh, with renovating Central Middle School. Um, uh, out of the gate, without us really educating our community about it, that was like 51% already. Uh, people that said they needed more information was like 31%. So if you could move just 10% of that group over, there's your support for adding that to the sinking fund, the renovations, uh, and a technology bond that's part of it. Then there was that one question that listed probably 14 or 16 different categories of what the highest priorities were for the district. And it was very interesting to look at that. Not a big surprise. Uh, the vast majority of our parents wanted the value and an education related to career and college readiness. Uh, clearly, that quality education uh, strand came through. Um, class size was important. Number one on that list was college and career readiness. Uh, so not a lot of surprises there. We have invited William to, uh, we don't really have a public statement to make about it yet because we haven't seen anything uh, official in writing. But we have asked William if he would come to the board meeting uh, on December the 10th and actually do a PowerPoint and walk all of you through, through that. What I wanted to share was enough of that to whet your appetite based on what he shared with us this morning because we were wondering what the readiness was out there in the community for going after a sinking fund uh, coupled with or without a technology bond. And I can tell you that the results of that look pretty optimistic for us. So I think tonight a point that I hope to get across to the community is that we could very well, this is your decision, of course, as a Board of Education, but we could very well be looking at a May 2013 election of some sort. Exactly what that would be is going to have to be determined. Uh, we'll talk about the report in the FFO committee that's coming up here in another week or so prior to that board meeting and see if we can dig into some of the detail at that point in time. But the results were um, really, really pretty darn good. Yeah, yeah, really positive. Excellent. There you go. We'll wait for the formal report, but that's a good indicator. Um, <coughs> Carl, do you want to talk about the non-discrimination and the EEO 
policy? Yep, you have a, a copy of the policy here. We included it in your packet. This is a recommendation from Neola, our policy consultant company. Um, it was interesting, I just read something in the paper from Dow Chemical actually that mm. they had parallel issues that they were also adopting as a company and I think under Howard Ungerleiter's leadership they were going down a similar path. So from my mind it's more perfunctory, it's something that we have to do in order to stay in compliant with legislation that's listed on the bottom of this policy. So we bring it to you for a first reading this evening. Okay. I don't believe it's there as an agenda item, it's for no, information. No, it's not for, it's just for information. Yeah. So uh, fellow board members, everybody reads and absorbs that. So we're ready for the next meeting. That would be great. Okay, moving on to administrative surfaces. Uh, Lynn, do you have a study committee report? I do. Uh, November 16th, the administrative services study committee met and we reviewed the following items. Merchandising section of Chapter 12, the operating regulations of how Midland schools work related to the practice of the sale and distribution of food to students in the school buildings. And then we reviewed NEOLA policy 1422, the non-discrimination and equal employment opportunity, which Carl just mentioned and um, has been given to us for information and we will adopt at the December 10th board meeting. And on uh, the third item was the policy for the participation of students in the graduation ceremony section of Chapter 8, Student Services of How Midland Schools Work, related to early college graduation and student participation. Can I just add, uh, we talked about this before the meeting, the recommendation from this committee, um, and we'll bring a policy recommendation change to December the 10th is that the students that are in the early college program, our my recommendation to you is that you let them participate in graduation. That actually comes from this um, administrative services uh, group as a recommendation. It was a pretty interesting discussion because we talked about it from the point of view of if you were a student, we talked about it from the point of view of how much control does the district want to have over what a diploma from Midland Public Schools means? And then we looked at it from the point of view of if you just separate those first two things out and say what is the purpose of the graduation? Is it more social in nature? You know, in some respects it is because you've got all the parties, the walking with your, you know, um, friends that maybe you've had since kindergarten. I thought I was really proud of the committee for taking a full view of this and saying, Let's do what we think is the best interest of students. So it's going to come to you as a recommendation that they participate, not that they graduate sure. until they can complete the program, but that they participate. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to curriculum and instruction. And John, I think you have a report. Yes. Uh, we met on uh, November 19th um, as the uh, Curriculum and Special Services uh, Study Committee. Uh, myself, Ms. Baker, Mr. Ellinger, Ms. Uh, Dr. Olson and uh, Ms. Gordon met at the Juvenile Care Center. Um, Bob Paris, uh, Daniel Rutterbush, and Carla Cook uh, joined the committee to describe the program at the JCC and lead a tour of the facility. Julie Reed, a supervisor of the facility, led us through the building and discussed various components of the program and how the whole process works to meet the needs of adolescents housed there. Um, data on providing wraparound services in this way indicate this is an effective way to handle these youths with uh, these needs. Uh, the meeting opened with uh, Mark Butcher, director of, of the JCC, welcoming our committee and gave us a brief overview of the number of students participating in the facility. He noted that the JCC opened in 1997 has been a great partnership between Midland County Probate Court and many county and community services along with Midland Public Schools providing the educational component. He shared copies of the 2011 annual report which indicates the success of the program. We learned that there are two components to the program at the JCC, uh, day treatment and detention. Uh, detention students reside at the JCC. They are court ordered, stay days to weeks at the facility, use E2020, and enjoy the benefits of having their teacher communicate and collaborate with their teachers at MPS. Students in the detention are not limited uh, to residents in Midland County. Day treatment students are court ordered, stay in the program a semester at a time, attend from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. with transportation to the site from their homes. They use E2020 and gain from the JCC staff align, aligning their teaching with the MPS curriculum. These students are from Midland County only. 
A major emphasis in this program is to recover credits so students are back on track to graduate. After visiting several classrooms and observing students participating in discussion and working on E2020, we toured the remainder of the building. We observed the gym, the lunchroom, uh, individual rooms, cafeteria, the condition, uh, the uh, in kitchen, uh, laundry intake room, and the central control area. Uh, there was also room for observing suicidal adolescents and rooms for conferencing and evaluating students. Uh, teachers at this facility are employed by MPS and plan and deliver the same curriculum to these students as other students in our school. They are highly qualified and certified in special ed. Clearly they have a passion for their chosen field. Uh, and finally, we were able to view the photographs and captions on student artwork in the halls, uh, which were in in inspirational and uh, motivating um, yeah, for us to come back for a show in the spring. Um, I don't know if uh, Ms. Baker or Ms. Gordon wanted to add to that. I, I thought it was just a, uh, it was an insight into uh, a, a facility and a, a organization in the community that I, I knew very little about, and I felt really enriched by going and, and visiting. I thought it was fabulous. One thing that really uh, stood out to me was how challenging it is for those teachers because they don't even have the same students every day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they might have a student for one day. Mm -hmm. They might have a student for a week or two weeks, you know, but every day the composition of their class changes. And, uh, and I just was kind of overwhelmed by that. I was trying to imagine teaching that way. I think it would be very challenging. So I think they really deserve a lot of credit. They do an excellent job, and they have a very hard job, I think, very challenging job. I would just comment that I think uh, our community and our schools need to be really appreciative of a facility like that. They emphasize that so many times and how successful it is. I went through the annual report and, and the recidivism rate is quite low and um, these kids learn not just get their education but it really is focused on life skills and, and developing the skills to be a um, community member in the future that gives back. and, and leads a good life so it's always very very interesting to go this is I think the third time I've been there and you see positive changes each time and um, just very fascinating I, I great we have it but I sure don't uh, think the kids would like to be there rather than in their school so. <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you I can remember my very first committee meeting was there as a member of the board and uh, I came away with two major impressions. Number one, that was uh, Judge Morris's uh, lifelong endeavor and dream come true. And it's a, it's a nice facility, and it gives kids that chance. And it, it's, it's great from that aspect. And then number two, uh, the dedication of our staff that, uh, who have the passion and, and the patience, as, as uh, Yvonne talked about, to deal with unique situations they wouldn't deal with over at Dow High or Midland High per se. And uh, hats off to them and, and the community owes them a debt of gratitude for what they do and how they do it in that situation. I don't remember when they, we opened the facility <coughs> the very first time we engaged in a partnership with Midland Public Schools. I mean, it's oh, been a great yeah. partnership for a long time now. It really was. Yep. It's not something unique we offer. It's great. Okay, uh, moving on to finance. Uh, Rick, I believe you have a FFO. Yep, I do, very briefly. Actually, most of the things we talked about here were already covered tonight, but I'll, I'll briefly go through it, or quickly go through it. Um, this is November 20th. Um, last Tuesday, Mr. Belindi reported on the progress toward middle school consolidation. And next summer, the computer lab in room 214 in Northeast will be moved to the media center to provide additional classroom space. In addition, one of the two modulars will need to be used for the 2013-14 school year only. Uh, just like we talked about a few minutes ago, Mr. Ellinger announced that the Cobalt Communications Survey had concluded at 4 p.m. that day, and that preliminary results would be available um, before the next board meeting, <laughs> before the end of Wednesday, but uh, he just shared those with us uh, briefly. In the meantime, uh, administration has been making preparations and that would allow the board to hold a sinking fund and or bond election um, on May 7, 2013, which uh, Mr. Ellinger just commented on as well. Should the board vote to authorize an election at the December 10th meeting, administration has the necessary arrangements in place for a technology consultant bond counsel, financial advisor, and enrollment consultant to complete the required application for a meeting with the Department of Treasury that has been scheduled for January 11th. Treasury approval is required before the board may submit the ballot language to the local election coordinator by the February 26th deadline. Ms. Ellinger presented the preliminary five-year cost estimates for the new tech and international baccalaureate primary years program, which we just reviewed. In addition, approval of these additions through the major change proposal would be contingent on funding. 
And then due to time constraints, a number of agenda items were removed from the agenda or moved to the December meeting, which we suspect will be pretty lengthy. And the financial statements were then um, were presented and uh, they appeared already tonight in our consent agenda. So next meeting is on December 4th and copies of these minutes, I'm sure all the other minutes are available to the general public outside. So. Thank you. Ms. Klein, can I hand it over to you for donations? Uh, we have gifts totaling $10,800 that we have received. The donors are the Laura Ludington Hollenbeck Foundation, supporting some programs at Central Middle School, Midland Area Community Foundation, providing support for Dow High's Camp Outlook, and then the HH Dow High School Athletic Booster Club, providing support for a variety of items. In addition, we would like to acknowledge the Wool Gas Corporation and Kevin Spencer from Edward Jones. They both provided support for our opening staff breakfast that we invite the entire staff of the district to, Central Middle School. Uh, Wool Gas provided the breakfast and Kevin provided the beverages. So we're very grateful <coughs> to them. We appreciate their support uh, of our staff and of our schools. Outstanding. Again, so is our community support. And thank you to everybody on the list. It's wonderful. Okay, moving on to human resources, I'll turn it over to Mr. Verlinde. Yes, uh, for your information, we have one staff member who has announced her retirement effective March 1st, 2013, and that's M Ms. Marilyn Allen, a math teacher at Northeast and Middle High School, and we appreciate her service. Thank you. Um, you'll see the list in the agenda of the correspondence to and from the board, and our next scheduled meeting is December 10th. 7 p.m. at our usual location here. And now we'll move on to study discussion uh, for other points of order people, board members want to bring up. I'll start to my right. Oh, all right. Well, I had a couple things. First, I want to thank whoever from Northeast sent me this happy holiday sheet. Mm -hmm. The camera is really appreciate that. Whoever drew that did a fabulous job. Um, I had the opportunity to go see Dow High's performance of Schoolhouse Rocks the other night. I know Lynn was there too. It was it was great. I, I know that brought me back to my youth. I don't know how much my kids knew about it, but they went and they very much enjoyed it also. And then um, this past week I had the chance to attend, well, I guess it was my second ever, but um, middle school swim meet, which was phenomenal. I know one of the questions on the survey we all did was about expanding the pools, and it happens to be a passion of mine. And so it was just, it was phenomenal to see. There's 47 girls from Jefferson. There were a huge, I was surprised, huge number of girls from Central who were both at this meet that I was at, and I know they have at least an equal number at Northeast Swimming and Middle School, and it was a wonderful event to go to. And that would be it. Okay. I, I was really happy to hear uh, some of the preliminary results. I know the full, full report is due to come out, but um, sort of my take home message from that is the community I think is ripe for looking at 21st century learning. Uh, technology, how that uh, can look in the hands of our students and in the classroom, uh, and really supportive innovation. And it uh, does uh, does give some support to what can we do differently as a district. I really, really feel that uh, the future is going to be coming upon us looking at um, how can we innovate and how we, can we do things differently. Um, I just think that things are going to move rapidly whether we like it or not, unfortunately. Um, and then as we look at our future bond proposals, um, sinking funds and so forth, um, as we develop that, I, you know, I, I know Mr. Ellinger, I know our directors are going to look at who's working with the students, the, you know, the teachers, principals, and so forth to look at exactly what we need. I'm looking forward to see what is happening with the iPad initiatives, the feedback from that, and so forth. So I just think everything's uh, in a row. I think we're going to get hopefully some... Uh, Good feedback, learn along the way, and I'm just really excited to see that that we've come so far, but we have so far to go. Okay. Mr. Oli and Ms. Baker. Yep. Well, as Angela said, the Dow High Play uh, Schoolhouse Rock was very entertaining, and um, it brought back some uh, some of those uh, shows that were playing when my kids were young that I haven't heard for a few years. I'm a little too old to have remembered them when I was young, but. Uh, <laughs> Through the kids, but they did a great job as, as always. There's always so much talent, and it's always so enjoyable. And uh, the night before was Rap City Rendezvous, uh, Midland Highs program, and once again, uh, it was fantastic and a successful event that took many, many hours of uh, hard work, dedication, and again, a talented, talented group. 
And uh, I, I can't go without saying what a talented uh, group of staff that always puts on uh, the second to the last performance. And uh, you never know what to expect. And uh, they didn't disappoint again this year. Um, this Friday, the uh, elementary is, is putting on their Spanish fiesta at Central Middle School. And, and um, anybody can attend. It is always a, a fun event. I don't know Spanish very well, but I sure enjoy all the, uh, the activities that are going on, from games to food to um, interacting and, and the kids' performances. And along that line, looking at this list that was given us tonight, um, December is always full of lots of concerts and activities, so hopefully we can attend some of those. And I would encourage um, parents, Carol mentioned, and uh, about the information night on the new tech program that'll be at Northeast on December 3rd and uh, I continue to learn more and more about that program and it thoroughly enjoyed my visit when I got to go to Dallas but I would encourage anybody that's interested in that to go and, and uh, to the program because what better place to get some really good information and to understand the program a little bit better and I think on that note I'll pass it to Ms. Torres. Thanks Wendy. Um, I just want to thank the community, everybody participated, providing input on that survey. That's really valuable stuff, and I think we're all really anxious to look at the details of it at our next meeting. It's uh, been a while since we did a survey like that, and historically we found a tremendous amount of value in all of those surveys, so this is really kind of a good time for us. And the I, return rate, by the way, was 27%, yeah, was which he, uh, he indicated today in the telephone that um, if you get up in the high teens, that's pretty darn good. If you get close to 20%, it's considered outstanding, and we were at 27%. So he felt that that created enough of a broad base, that there was solid information there in all areas on the survey to justify it. So mm -hmm. that was That's exciting. Good. That is good. I'm going to comment, and I guess I'm going to get to the point where you guys won't actually hear me say this anymore, and kind of do some reflection back, but my first 10 years on the board was really kind of an era of, of upcoming growth, of change, of adding new programs, doing studies to relook curriculums of elementary school and middle school and high school and, and what have you. In the last 10 years, it's been a different era, obviously, because we've had more financial challenges where we've had to do similar or more with less and resources and, quite frankly, kind of reduction, closing kind of mode oftentimes as financial challenges. And I'm really kind of upbeat about the next 10 years, although I won't be sitting at this table for the next 10 years. Just look at the things we talked about tonight. It's all about change, and you're right, John. It's all about innovation. and. and even including the whole school aid act kind of stuff. Whatever that turns out to be, whether it's done in a month or done five years from now, there's significant change in front of us probably. And quite frankly, I think we all feel we need that. We don't want it to adversely affect Midland Public Schools, but I think we all recognize that education in the state needs some revamping along the way. But then look at the PYP and, and look at the new tech and that kind of stuff. And that's really exciting stuff, and that won't happen overnight either. So five or 10 years from now, Midland Public Schools, either by decisions this future boards make or that the state is making for us, if you will, is going to look tremendously different. And I think, on the most part, that's going to be very positive. I think it's going to be very positive. And the other thing that we've always had going for us, and will continue to have going for us, and I think Carl emphasized it tonight, things like PYP and things like New Tech can only happen with a continued strong partnership with our community, whether it be individual members of the community, whether it be you know other groups out there that are going to help support our, our initiatives in the future, and that's been a strength that Midland Public Schools has always had. So the next 10 years is going to be highly dependent on ongoing, continued partnerships with the community to innovate, to do new things in different ways, to continue to make public schools attractive to everybody, but also uh, provide the best possible education for all of our current kids and the future kids. So on behalf of all of you that are going to be sticking around, I'm pretty upbeat. I'm kind of invigorated about what the next five to 10 years are, are going to look like. Um, it's going to be a lot of change, and I think that's good. That's good. So that's all I got. Well, I'm glad you said that because that makes me feel better. I have some fears, I guess, about the you know changes in the, the new Michigan Public Education Finance Act, and I hate to be the person who's afraid of change. I, I don't want that to be me, you know. But um, I do have some concerns about that. I guess everybody does. That's to be expected, I guess. But um, they're kind of offset by the excitement of the prospects of the PYP and the new tech. I think those are very exciting. And of course, tonight we got a lot of information, so. I'm going to have to think about all that and really sort through it. But um, I guess uh, I, I just, I'm real glad you said that, and I want to share your enthusiasm. And also, I'd like to reiterate what you said we have such strong community support, and we're mm -hmm. so fortunate. You know, a lot of districts just don't have that. So I think it's, we're really, really fortunate to have that. I guess it's back to me. Um, 
I said it earlier, I, and Rick and, and John and everybody said it, I am embracing this, the changes that are coming. Uh, I love what we're doing on our own initiative um, in terms of how we offer education and programs we offer to our kids with, with the new tech, um, with the, the, the PYP. It just, it just reinforces that we want to move in directions that um, we employ methods that are new, different, and unique that can help teach our kids and make them lifelong learners that we want to make them. And these things drive that direction. And it's, as far as the state education changes, I eagerly embrace what might be in there. I look at that and not sit there and go, hmm, how is this going to negatively impact us? But there's a pony in here somewhere, as the old joke goes. And being a high-performing district and one that has talent, uh, outstanding talent among staff, I mean, that means administrators and teachers. How do we offer and how are we uniquely positioned to take advantage, uh, take advantage of a change that will be thrust on everyone? Uh, we don't have to envision the change. It's going to be told to us. And the question is, how do we uniquely take advantage of that, not just for our own students to grow? I mean, that, that's going to be very important. Obviously, the principles here are how do we have student growth and, and learning, but how can we use the things we create for our own students to help other students that help us on the revenue side to help our students even more. This could be a very synergistic play for us if we get adroit at how we look at it and, and how we can play it. I still have my concerns about uh, legislation that races way too fast. I will be expressing that because it's just not a good way to create legislation. It's not good sausage making. Uh, but I think there's going to be opportunity here and we're just going to have to uh, I'm confident we're going to figure out how to make an opportunity out of it versus a burden out of it. And that's going to be, that's going to be the key to middle public schools future. Carl. Uh, just two things, a reminder, Lynn had mentioned it. you have a December uh, calendar of events? And then uh, Cindy separated out for you the holiday concerts. That must be the most fun part of uh, mm -hmm. all the things that are on this list. Uh, last thing I would mention to you is you've all been gracious enough to hold a couple of Saturday mornings out in your calendars. Um, I was on the phone with the Michigan Association of School Boards this morning. Uh, it looks like the day that's going to work out will be the 12th. And I know that's a conflict, Angela, for you with an event. You were gracious enough to say that uh, in order to be there at a board retreat, uh, you would make that work. The following Saturday didn't work for two others, uh, so we appreciate that. We're trying to nail exactly who, uh, nail down exactly who was available from MASB to come up and help us uh, with a retreat for the Board of Education on that morning from 8 until noon. So uh, please keep the 12th and the 19th, uh, the AM, in your calendars for those of you that will still be on the board uh, after January 1. <laughs> but it looks like we're narrowing in on the, <laughs> it looks like we're narrowing in on the uh, 12th. Uh, and thank you for being accommodating for that. And, of course, uh, Mrs. Vander Kellen's in the back. And um, Scott McFarland actually emailed me shortly before the board meeting. And he has sick children. And now he's not feeling well either. He would have been in the audience tonight also. Yeah. <laughs> so we will stayed ask, home. Uh, thank you, Scott. <laughs> we will ask Kim and Scott to, to make themselves available for that board retreat. It's actually a nice transition, Jerry, to take the kind of things that we talked about tonight and carry them on at a board retreat where we can talk about goals for the district, long-term planning. We can talk about what it means uh, is the role of the Board of Education and the operations of the district. So we're very much looking forward to that morning with you. Excellent. That's it. Well, anything else for the good of the order? Um, seeing none, we are adjourned.